Welcome to episode 25 of More Than Just Maps. I'm your host, Ollie Powers. This podcast was created with the intent to help anyone in the GIS field get from where they are now to where they want to be, be that your first job, a career move, or just improving your GIS game overall. On this week's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Liz Parrish of Esri. Liz got her start in GIS after unknowingly doing GIS in her career in real estate. After wetting her palate, she went back to school to learn more about it and become a GIS professional. We chat about how more graduate business programs are incorporating GIS into their curriculums, exposing more people to GIS early on in their careers, and what it's like to build a GIS from scratch for a newly incorporated municipality. And now for part one of my interview with Liz Parrish. Welcome back to this episode of More Than Just Maps. Today I've got Liz Parrish, who's a business consultant with Esri. Welcome, Liz. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. So let's get started. How did you get into GIS? Let's go all the way back to the beginning where where the spark first started. Oh, that's a really um, good and winding story. Um, I had a background in banking, which led me into real estate. And in real estate, my specialization was marketing, real estate marketing. And so I worked at a commercial real estate company in Atlanta, and I worked on the acquisitions and dispositions team. So my a part of my responsibility was analyzing um, all the information about a given property, if we might acquire it, and then if we were going to sell it out of our portfolio, I would do all of the analytics and put together reports and marketing materials to then sell a property. And then the the third thing that I would do is a a huge, it ended up being about 300 um, pages consolidated uh, quarterly investors report on our entire portfolio. That's a giant report. (laughs) It's a giant report, right? So through doing this, you know, I'm looking at properties and uh, thinking about them in terms of like what recommendations I would make or analyzing like where things are good or, you know, what properties are better than others and taking a look at, you know, what kinds of tenants we might get into a shopping center. For example, through all of this, I was looking at demographics traffic counts. And I was using Microsoft map point to actually put dots on a map. So I would, for um, most of my materials, use Adobe InDesign and CS in general. But I was building out marketing materials and then this like quarterly report in InDesign. So I would literally take an aerial photography um, shot that we may have gotten of of a region and then overlaying um, logos of the businesses in the area on top of where they were and, you know, putting a star and information on top of the subject property and then um, using Microsoft map point to do like a one, three, five mile um, buffer for demographics and all GIS, <laughs> all GIS, right? But I'm doing it in this um, really hodgepodge kind of way. So there was a time where the company I was working for did a joint venture with a multifamily housing developer. So think big luxury apartment communities. And working with them on this joint venture. Um, We were putting together some marketing materials and my counterpart at that company sent me over some things and his stuff looked beautiful. It didn't look like my stuff. (laughs) I I asked him, I said, how did you do this? This is fabulous. And he said, "Um, oh, well, it's GIS. I said, what's that? And so he told me that he had... um, a program and that you could even take a class on it. Um, and I just, I was blown away. So at the time, you know, 
coincident to this, I was actually going back to school to get a um, business degree. Well, like all college degrees, you have to fulfill so many credits in given areas, English, math, et cetera. Well, my social sciences credit, I still had one or two classes to take. So, and this is for like an, an associate's degree. And I found out that my university had an intro to GIS class that would fill that social sciences. So I took it. And after I did, I just was so blown away with the power of insight and information that you can get out of a GIS. And um, this was, I want to say, my very first class was old, old arc something, I want to say like eight point something. So it's pretty far back. Uh, yeah, it was, it was really far back. So, um, definitely nothing like, um, ArcGIS today or even some of the other open source systems. Um, but regardless, it was still very powerful. So as I'm working through, um, the intro to GIS class, I actually start applying some of what I'm learning in my job and I'm just really seeing like how powerful, it could be, regardless of what industry you're in. So the were ability you to convince them to, to actually purchase ArcGIS or were you doing it in a different software? No, I um I wasn't able to to do that. I didn't um I didn't even know that much about it to even have that conversation. Had I had I stayed in that industry and stayed with that company longer into my education in GIS, I would have absolutely um, requested that, lobbied for it, and, and could have easily made the case for the benefits there. Because we were, as a company, consuming third-party information um, from companies like CoStar and, um, like I said, using Mac- Microsoft MapPoint and other things that we had to resubscribe to every year. So I, I probably could have, but I eventually ended up leaving that company and transitioning into the world of GIS. So I I loved that class and saw it was so powerful that instead of transferring into my second, you know, half of my, you know, college degree being international business, I actually found that there was a university in the Atlanta area that had a GIS bachelor's. And um, they had evening classes, so it was geared towards like working professionals. So I actually went over and met with the uh, program head and decided that, yeah, I wanted to actually go and get my degree in GIS instead of a degree in business at the time. Um, And that's what I did. So I kind of pivoted and changed my plan a little bit. And then as I got further into my program was taking advanced GIS and, um, you know, other classes in and around that special topics uh, type of things, I just decided that's really, it didn't matter what industry I was in, I really wanted to do much more GIS. The power of it kind of across the board, just even to this day, I'm still excited about it. Yeah, I know that's one of the things that actually really excited me about it as well. When people ask, well, what industry is this in? I would sit there and be like, well, it's in every industry. Any industry can use this. And people didn't really understand that. They're like, no, like you're either in accounting or you're in healthcare or you're in <laughs> or you're in government. It's like, yes, we're in all of those. <laughs> and that's one of the fantastic things about this. I, I love that about GIS. I do too. And um I think, I don't know the statistic now. There, there was a statistic like at least uh, maybe 10 years ago. I remember, and I, I don't remember the source from it, but something like 80% of all business data, regardless of what industry you're in, whether it's public or private, 80% has a location component to it. Because you think about, 
your facility is located somewhere, your employees are located somewhere, your um, customers or constituents are located somewhere, your assets are located somewhere, your transactions of whatever you do are located somewhere. So 80% or more of what you do as an organization and in business has some kind of location component to it. How could, how could having that information not be a benefit? Exactly. So as I was finishing my degree, one of the things that I thought was really powerful and meaningful for um, the program that I was in, which by the way, was Kennesaw State University. And they had a GIS degree and you could choose three focus areas, one, one of the three focus areas. So you could choose environmental science. You could choose, oh my gosh, what is it called? It's the, like the land planning, urban, urban planning concentration or a business concentration, which for a while I think had gone away. And I think I heard recently it may be back, but because I was such a business centric person, That's what I chose because I really could see this in a commercial industry. And there are a lot of universities out there that GIS is usually part of either the urban planning or a real estate or um, an environmental science program. And it's not always a standalone degree where you can then, you know, get the other aspects as a secondary so I actually took the, the business track and I thought that was great because then I took marketing classes and other business centric classes, economics, finance, uh, things of that nature. But the other, the other really great thing about the program is it requires an internship to get your degree. So unlike a lot of other programs, and, and I don't mean GIS programs, just unlike other degrees in university where you might just do a project and, uh, you know, take an exam, the ones that actually require the hands-on to be able to say, yes, we're going to give you a degree. We think you are satisfactorily capable now of going out into the working world and, you know, carrying the torch that you have this education and this credential from our university in this field, it means something, right? We can stand behind that, you know, somebody hires you, you can actually, at least in an entry level, start and understand what you need to do and you're teachable. So I really liked that um, aspect of it. I was going to say, yeah, um, like, as you stated earlier, a lot of schools will have, they don't even have the business portion of it. Um, which is surprising considering the applications for business for GIS are like inf- infinite. You can do anything with GIS and business. But I know when I was in school, we had, we had human geography and then physical geography and you could use, or you could learn GIS within kind of those aspects, but there really mm-hmm. wasn't this tie over to business, which I think we would get a lot more recognition if they did start doing that, but when you, mm-hmm. in most schools, it's, it's kind of buried in the geography department. It is, it is. And what I'm, what I'm seeing a big push for in the last number of years is a greater effort in business schools to actually incorporate GIS, even if it's just one class. And even if it may just be from a marketing perspective, I'm, I'm seeing a little more of movement that way. And then especially, so working with Esri and the headquarters being in Redlands, California, the University of Redlands, which is, is right next door, is a big partner. So the business school there uses a lot of GIS. They are big partners of it. And there's, because of the familiarity with it and the power of it, there is a lot of then trickle down and dissemination of GIS, at least from an intro level, throughout a lot of different disciplines. So what I'm seeing more of is not as much 
at an undergrad level in, in the university systems that I'm seeing more in grad schools, uh, business grad schools, and then other, other cert- certain types of degree programs. That's where... interesting. Is it more like, like I know for, for my undergraduate it's, and like what your experience was, you had the intros to GIS. Mm-hmm. So are they doing more of that in the grad program or are they just like jumping feet first or head first into here, we're going to apply this to the situation? So I would say kind of think of that in a hybrid because given, given the absolute transition in the industry over the last 15 years, we now have SaaS products, right? Like ArcGIS mm-hmm. online, business analyst online. So we're able. And in case people aren't familiar with SaaS, can yes. you just define that? <laughs> Yeah, software as a service. So it's where you you pay a subscription fee and you log in through a browser to access the software. And then the things that are executed are executed on the servers of the company that's hosting the software instead of the old school way, which I mean, is still valid, but where you buy software and you load it on your local C drive, and then you do all the work on your local computer. And that is usually a much more heavy lift on the side of usability, like the ramp up to become proficient um, in the desktop side software, because if you're going to install it one time, then it has to be like this complete program and suite that has a lot of advanced functionality and you, you really have to become an expert at how uh, to navigate that. And you may not use 50% or more of the tools that are available, but because you're installing it one time, it's all there. And then you might get an update a year or two later. Um, but when it software as a service, anytime updates happen, they happen. And the next time you log in, the update's there. And then you're not having to worry about you know, anything that you haven't stored locally uh, crashing or or being gone. And it's just, it's very accessible. And as we've moved into that browser-based software as a service kind of world, things in the tech industry have evolved and uh, become a lot more user-friendly. So the way that things are designed from like a UI UX perspective is much more intuitive and it's just the usability for somebody for starting it it's a pro, it's very approachable so the way that things are laid out you can see oh here's one make a map here's another do analysis you know here's another yeah. big big button print you know things like that so Going with that um, kind of layout and the ribbon approach that we've become so accustomed to with like using, say, Microsoft um, Word and Excel, where at the top you've got, you know, your ribbon of different commands or, or big button, you know, types of tools that you would use. So moving into web G- web-based GIS certainly, I think, has made it so much better for the entire community of people who want to use GIS, but also in the education community, because now we're able to not have to have that intro to GIS that is fundamentally just trying to teach you how to navigate getting tools and doing basics. You can actually start the conversation with, okay, we're in a business marketing class what is your business you want to market, like come up with an idea and then, okay, what do we want to know about that business? And so you can approach it from that problem solving by topic. So you'd have everybody in the entire class choose a different business, but everybody can then kind of go through the same steps to interrogate data and build a map and do some analysis of demographics and you know, come to some kind of informative conclusion about their, you know, proposed business 
like where they might locate it and how they might market it to somebody and who that demographic would be. And so I'm seeing in like the business schools, the, the intro to GIS being that web GIS and it being from let's solve a business problem or let's approach this from a business point of view. And then that way you're introducing it as a tool to accomplish what you need to do versus this really, really specialized software that's going to have such a huge learning curve. So For once sure. we take that learning curve and, and flatten it out a little bit, then it certainly makes it more accessible for more people. Yeah. I was actually going to make the joke of, oh yeah, there was an, there was an update. Now all my apps are broken, but you've just given like a whole slew of reasons why this is actually a good thing. So when your apps break, it sucks, but there's, there's a <laughs> lot more positives than negatives, I think, with the system. Yeah. And I would say if they are broken, obviously you want to look at why, what, what is it when you say broken? Like, what is it that's broken? Is is it that links are not there? Is it that a tool changed? You know, what, what maybe is the underlying cause? And then also looking at, um, you know, well, yes, it might be broken, but is it, a lot of new functionality that will make it even better when you, when you reset it and republish it. Right. We're going to backtrack a little bit. So you had gone on, you'd started your associate's degree, um, realized you wanted to go into GIS. So you started your GIS bachelor's degree uh, while working full-time, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, and I'm going to take it. You've graduated. Um, and then where did you go from there? Well, from there, I was graduating. So to set the stage, I was graduating as an adult learner in 2009. And anybody who was around in 2009 knows that was a horrible The worst time to graduate. (laughs) Well, and the worst time to be in the real estate industry, which is what I was in. Yep. So I actually had left the larger real estate company to go work for a startup while I was doing my GIS degree and was using some of my GIS knowledge in helping um, marketing and property management and whatnot for that startup. And then because we were small, I mean, we were hit hard and the company suffered just like people suffered. I mean, Mm -hmm. that, that was horrible. And so we ended up having to close up shop. Well, that was happening right as I was finishing up and doing my internship. But like you say, it was hard. It was hard to find a job. It's hard to find anything. I was struggling to even find an internship to get enough hours to finish up. But I finally was able to get on with a, um, like the water department at a county. Okay. Okay in, in Georgia where I lived and get in and do some projects with them. So that was fantastic to get in. And it was a departure for me, right? I had come from banking and real estate. And then all of a sudden I'm working in a utility department at a county. (laughs) So different, but I got to see, you know, another aspect of GIS where, you know, understanding from a municipal perspective, like the infrastructure, the, what has to go on for maintaining the infrastructure of a city and, or county and operations. And then, you know, having an idea of where all of those assets sit so that when you have a work crew that needs to go out, you send them to the right place. Or so that if a transmission line fails or a water pipe fails, that you understand what's before it and after it in the network. And then also, even from the county billing, you know, you're used to getting your water bill every month. Well, reconcile, a big project that I worked on was reconciling the roles of property and who owned it to the actual water meter that was on a given property. And so 
we were able to identify that there were a ton of meters that were out there with water usage that were not actually attached to the parcel that they were on and therefore were not getting billed. And that's so, a problem for them, I would guess. That's a prob- <laughs> that's problem. So it was really exciting to be able to see that the impact of the work that I was doing was meaningful. It was meaningful to the county. And by doing that project, like reconciled that we had about a million plus dollars of missing revenue, like missing <laughs> build, like legitimate usage that was outstanding because there, it had not been mapped correctly to who should get a bill for it. Yeah. And that's, I think it's going to be different for every industry, but having meaning in your work is, is so fundamentally important in whatever job you're doing. If you're, when I was in school, I, I worked a lot of retail and restaurant jobs and mm-hmm. you go there and, and you slept through your shift and you go home and you're like, I know I'm getting a mm-hmm. paycheck, but I hate this. And then when you finally yeah. get into the industry or whatever it is, not that like for some people, I'm sure retail and, and restauranting is, is there, is their thing. But if it's not your thing, uh, once you do get into, into your space and you, and you get into the area you want to be in just that the entire shift of, Hey, I'm doing something that matters finally, that changes everything about how you think of your career, your job, just your daily life. It all changes. And it's so fulfilling and just so important. And, and the fact Absolutely. that you were able to actually connect that. And obviously you didn't stay in utilities, but you were able to get that feeling of, Hey, what I'm doing matters. And that's right. so important. Right. Yes. And so that, that job that I had was as a contractor. So you know, it was a contract that the AEC firm that I was employed by had with the county. So when I wrapped up that project, I actually wrapped up the project early. So there was still time on my contract that they put me on, you know, some different other, other assignments for a week here, a week there, all remote. I mean, I worked in the office, but the work itself was for remote. I didn't have to go to a different organization and Mm -hmm. sit in their office, but then that contract was up. So at that point, here I am, I'm looking for a GIS job. And even though I've got, you know, a lot of business background, I now have this like six months in government. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, this is a fabulous experience so amazing, getting an opportunity to go to the city of Johns Creek, Georgia, and starting a GIS. So the city of Johns Creek was previously part of Fulton County, and it was an unincorporated area. And as as is often the case, right, you have urban sprawl, and then you get enough people in an area, and they say, we want to incorporate, we want to be our own city. Well, there's a big process to that, right? You have to, you have to, Not only the legal part, but then you have to have a city government, you have to have, you know, city um, planning, and uh, you have to start up your police and fire or figure all of that out. Well, there are other things you have to figure out too, like permitting and, you know, any kind of development and And none of these things are small tasks these are all monumental by themselves (laughs) and when you're doing them all at once I can't even imagine the just the sheer amount of work that has to go into that yes so I city of Johns Creek had been incorporated just for a few years and because of the monumental aspect of of that um startup they would do a public-private partnership, which is where you, in order to streamline, you don't have everything be city-owned operations or city-owned employees. So you actually do contract out some to private contractors or, you know, partners. And that's what they were doing. And it, it does make it very efficient in many ways. And then, They had, through this, though, done their GIS only part-time and through um, a partner company. But they realized that, you know, it had been a couple of years. 
they did not actually have a centralized um, system. And they were growing as a city and the operations were coming up to speed and there was that need to transition everything to where it was city-owned servers and a, a system of record that they had control over instead of contracting out, hey, can you make me this map or that map? And they realized that there was a lot more that they could get out of it, you know, realize the benefit of, of GIS throughout all their different operations. So for sure, um, they hired two of us, Nick O'Day, who I believe is going to actually be one of our speakers in our speaker series for Texas Charissa later in the fall, mm -hmm. and then myself. So Nick was the GIS manager and handled the server side administration and uh, really learned how to build apps. So he was self-taught developer um, on that at the time. And then I was the GIS analyst. So I was the one looking at all of the analytics and um, producing a lot of the product and data building. So it was really interesting. And what, what this experience was, was going in to a place where GIS had been a tangential um, service, really. And it was kind of on demand. Somebody would say, hey, I need a map for this. Hey, I need a map for that. But that's really how they thought about it. They thought about it as it's just a map, a map for an event, a map to show something, a map of a road. But they didn't, they weren't using it for informing decisions and they weren't using it to engage the population of either internal or external stakeholders. So they also didn't own, a, own and have authoritative data sets. There were numerous different data sets because they didn't, prior to that, they didn't have their own servers. Yeah. So whoever was doing the work, there was a data set on somebody's computer somewhere. Which and a map on not, somebody's computer. <laughs> yeah, that's not uncommon for a lot of cities still today. It's There's not, still a lot no. of cities where it's like, this person has this shape file, like not even geodatabase, shape file. Mm -hmm. And this person has this shape file. And this person has this shape file. And none of them are in the same department. <laughs> right, exactly. So for us, it was the ability to come in and it was early enough that we were able to really assess and inform how we wanted to build it out. And that's not to say that, you know, you don't make changes later on, you learn from things and you, and you shift, but we were able to come in and really take a look at planning and identifying what authoritative data sets did we need? What kind of nomenclature did we want to have? have so that we could not only make it easy for other people to use, but easy for us to maintain and access. Like if we needed to know, oh, well, what's the street network? Well, guess what? It better be named street network, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, <laughs> things like that. Um, because yeah, I know I remember looking matters. when I was in school still and just downloading random data sets from, from government agencies. And some of them would have these just crazy crazy, crazy systems that they would, there'd be a lot of data involved, but they would, the nomenclature was just all, all coded and you needed a data dictionary to figure out, Hey, I've got a field here with numbers in it. I have no idea what this field right. means because it's field FCC.531.AZ5. Exactly. <laughs> and that doesn't, you'd have to go through the list, try to figure out what that is. And then, and it, right. it was a nightmare. And that, that that's not, I understand from the helpful. point where if you have a lot of data, <laughs> but at the same time, you need this to be accessible. It's not just scientists looking mm -hmm. at this stuff. You've got everyone looking at this stuff. Well, and you just said something important too, a data dictionary. Like you need to have, and I realize that people are like, ugh, going to groan. All our GIS folks out there are going to like roll their eyes and groan. Yeah. And go, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. But metadata I know I will stomp on the pulpit and preach metadata. 
because it's so important. It tells it sucks people. To build it. We know how it much does. it sucks to build, but it's when you need it, it and the inf- you need that information. Yes, it's so important to have it there and available because if you need to know, hey, I need to know the last exactly. time it was updated, or I need to know what the source data for this is, where they get yes. this. If you need something important, especially if it's for a legal matter, you need exactly. to have that. You can't just be like, uh, yeah, it was exactly. just it's just there. That's what we've got. That doesn't work. <laughs> no, that doesn't work. And if you go to, like you say, a legal matter, right? You want to say, hey, um, you need to have flood insurance on your parcel because you're in the flood zone. Okay, you need to be able to prove that your, you know, source of information is the FEMA flood maps, right? That it's mm-hmm. a legal like legitimate source that you as a city did not just make it up to get them to buy flood insurance. Or if you have to go like to court for anything, you know, you need to be able to say, okay, this is the analysis that I did. These are the data sets I use. This is how it was processed. And, you know, here's, here's the output. And especially for things like that, like you have to back up everything. Yes. So metadata is absolutely important. A data dictionary because you have to realize that not everybody is going to have the background. And ideally, you're not always going to be the person in that job. Ideally, you are going to grow and you're going to move into different roles and take on different responsibilities and um, you know, being thoughtful for the people that come behind you. For sure. Is really, really important. And then, of course, there's what at one job I had, they always called it the hit by the bus rule. You leave today and you get hit by a bus. Yeah. Somebody needs to do this job tomorrow. I think every and, place has the hit by the bus rule. <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible to say, but I should, I, I have said this recently. I'm like, I really should stop saying that. I should say the lottery ticket, the lottery rule. Like if you win the lottery and you just jet off to, you know, Bali and you don't show up tomorrow, how are we going to, how are we going to do this? <laughs> So um, yeah. that would be much, much more pleasant. I should, I should be mindful of that. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I just really think that getting into local government was so beneficial for me because at the city, we realized we met with all the departments, took an assessment of like what data they need to use. And then we, we prioritize like, okay, what is the key data that everybody needs and that we need like right away? And then started, started digitizing. I geo-referenced the plats for everything in that 28 square mile city. And that's, I mean, you're not uh-huh. the first person I've talked to who's who's been like, yeah, my first job or one of my first jobs was creating the data for a place. Creating the data and being mindful and and careful about creating the data, not being sloppy about it and making sure that, you know, so I generated, I, you know, geo-referenced the plats and then from the plats extracted and geo-referenced the data off of them, like where are the fire hydrants in an, in a subdivision? Where are the, um, control boxes for the power for like the tennis court lights or, or whatever, um, all kinds of data. But primarily, we were also trying to make sure that first and foremost, like the um, street network and address points, those were the first two data sets that were key because we support, as a city, you support E911. And in addition to anything else, the first thing that you have to do is make sure that if there's an emergency, that you can route to the right place. Yep. And to do that, you have to have a good street network and an address. Accurate 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 address points. (laughs) Yes. So we started there and then went into things like the storm sewer network. Um, In the city, they did not maintain their own other utilities. Mm -hmm. Um, That was still done by the county. So, you know, there was limited amount that we had to do there, but the streets and um, parks and greenways and then storm sewer and then all the other, you know, additional data. 
that, that we worked with, but that really taught me the importance of how having good, accurate data that's curated thoughtfully matters. Because if you looked at the data that we built versus what was there before, they're completely night and day. And it also, you know, gave me a lot of insight into when I look for data now and use data, you know, after that in in other roles that I've had, really being able to evaluate what is the quality of the data source, you know, and looking at both the metadata and then the actual quality of the data itself, the completeness of it as well, and say, you know, does this seem to have all of the information that I'm going to need? So it looks like you learned a lot in that in that job at Johns Creek, um, and it seems to have given you a fantastic foundation on on the the basics of GIS and the importance of of building your database uh, from the ground up, and just the quality of the data and how important that is. So from Johns Creek, you learned a lot, but how did you get into Esri at this point? Well, Johns Creek was an amazing place, and they still are. They are still an amazing example of of taking GIS with a small team and small resources and doing very, very big things. So proud to have have come from that background. And how I got into working at Esri was actually interesting because I did have such a great rapport with my manager at, at Johns Creek, and we had a discussion about career growth. And he's always been such a great mentor and, and friend. And you know, he said, ideally, in a larger organization, I would move up and you would transition and move up into to my role. But obviously, we're we're a team of two. And there's really, that's not how it's structured currently, that could be something many years down into the future. But, you know, I'll support you in anything you want to do. And I said, well, I definitely want to grow in other areas, um, not just be a GIS analyst. So I happened to be on the phone with Esri Technical Support, um, working on something geodatabase related, and really had great rapport with the analyst that I was working with. And I could tell she had a Southern accent. I'm from the South. We were just chatting while some tests were running in the background. And I asked her, I said, so how long have you been at Esri? Where are you from? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, how did you, how did you get a job there or whatever? And so we were talking and she said, you really have a lot of great troubleshooting um, approaches and you're very personable and we're hiring. You should, you should apply. And so I had never thought of it before, and I say that because it's like in the GIS world, Esri is like people think of Google and Microsoft and Amazon, right? Yeah, it's it's the 500-pound gorilla in the room. (laughs) Exactly. So it seems intimidating, right? It seems like I'm not qualified to work for Esri. A lot of people think that. It's like oh, well, I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough credentials. I don't have enough experience. I don't have whatever. And so I would not have on my own thought that. And then she said, oh yeah, you should, you should totally apply. So I did. And the interview process is pretty thorough and intense, multiple interviews um, on the phone and then and all day they fly you out uh, for a final interview in person all day it is not intimidating at all <laughs> no not at, not at all no. um and then yeah so then i got offered a job and um ended up moving to california and working at esri headquarters in tech support as a geo database analyst So uh, one of the things that was really great is, yes, obviously there are going to be roles at companies, Esri or otherwise, that there's a need within the particular um, position that they need you to have certain capabilities and skill sets on day one. However, 
there are a lot of roles in any organization that regardless of what it is, there's going to be some specialized work. So if you have some fundamentals, some of those very specialized things can be taught. So if you are open-minded and positive attitude and you're teachable, like you're willing to learn and also you have the capability of, of learning new things um, fairly easily, or, you know, if you're willing to put in the work to do it, then, you know, certainly that can come across. And I have, have learned that, you know, you might as well go for it and try because, you know, then they'll, they'll give you a mentor and teach you on the job. So as long as you understand the fundamentals, you can learn the specialized as you go along. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for, for talking with me today. This is great. And I can't wait to get to part two with you. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Join us again in a couple of weeks for part two, where we talk about all things imposter syndrome.